with, with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Broome County, uh, New York, and, and now for the Cornell Waste Management Institute. She's got a lot of experience working with composting, both with um, um, manure and with animal carcasses. Um, and more, more recently, she spends most of her time uh, between manure and carcass and butcher waste composting education and research. Um, Jean has an MS degree in education and communication from uh, State Un University of New York at Binghamton. Uh, Jean, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, just a quick detail in the beginning. This is a problem that we're all working on right now, and we don't we don't have all the solutions that are out there. We have a conference coming up on July 21st to the 23rd in, at UC Davis that's going to talk about disposal issues, and we encourage people to be there so that we can have good discussion, good panels, and stuff like that so that we can uh, continue to work on this issue. It's a national group that um, the Northeast has headed up. Next slide. Jill, you're forwarding. Yep. Okay. Um, the situation, lack of services, uh, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, we don't always have ser service, so we have to do something. Next. Um, the specified risk materials that the last two speakers have been talking about are not accepted in most places. The bans have gone into effect in different places in different countries. Um, it's reached us now, and it is a, a definite impediment. Um, but there are animals that aren't able to be uh, rendered anyway, and people that don't have rendering access. So there are some other tools that are uh, available. Uh, it also can be costly. Um, to dispose of animals in general. In general, so um, looking at a couple other things, the access I mentioned, there are just a lot of places, especially in New York, that don't have access at all. Uh, disposal options, alkaline uh, digestion. There isn't a lot of alkaline digestion, and it wouldn't be a very a cost-effective way to get rid of mass mortality or the amount of mortality that we have to get rid of our butcher waste. Um, rendering is um, a possibility, and it's, a, it's what we put out there first. If people can render, they should render. Uh, it does keep it out of the environment, and it does control things, and we really do promote people either rendering or composting properly. Okay. Uh, mass burial just simply brings the flesh weighs six feet closer to the groundwater. And that's not a helpful thing. Some states are starting to outlaw burial. Um, and Virginia is one of those. And I think that's going to be the case in some other places as well. Um, we still need those options. It will still be done in certain cases, but it can be a problem. Um, burning. Incineration and burning can be a problem. Um, so incineration generally is going to be, um, it's just going to put a lot of emissions into the air, and it's not a good idea in general. Most mass casualties that have used open burning or incinerators, controlled incinerators, have had problems and, and have been shut down by their environmental organizations just because of air pollution. Um, and composting, we're going to talk quite a bit about in the rest of the slide, so that's certainly an option. Next. Uh, I hate to say this, Jill, but this is the wrong version of the PowerPoint, so just go past this slide. Uh, I'll talk through it, but go past this slide. Um, we worked with a lot of agencies to deal with, with uh, how effective this would be. Um, animals that are at risk, animals that are showing odd signs, um, it's best to call the vet. The vet will deal with the situation and they'll actually dispose of the animal for you. So make sure that, that um, 
the animal is, doesn't exhibit those signs. If it does, call the vet. Next slide. Uh, okay. Um, we want to make sure that we are away from the ground and surface water, away from wells, um, and make sure that we're not polluting anything. 200 feet is not a magic number. It uh, is probably a good distance away, but we let, need to look for plants that grow in hydrologically sensitive areas like cattails and rushes and things like that, and we want to make sure that we're well away from water. Next slide. Uh, there are different different covers that can be used, different roofed structures that can be used. We can use a three-bend system. But when we're talking about large livestock, we generally don't do uh, mortality composting in small bins. We would do them in, um, in windrows, which you'll see in some other slides. These would be more for pigs, chickens, and really small losses. Next slide. Um, concrete bins can be used. They're effective. We can lay the windrows in those concrete bins, and we have a push wall to work with those. Next slide. Um, the, the next slide that I have is talks about carbon sources. And one of the things that we need for composting is carbon sources. Is carbon sources. And if we use good chunky material in the mix, we will have a good composting process. So we need to have something like wood chips or shavings, sawdust, uh, feed fusel, oil silage, chopped corn stalks, uh, nut holes, partially composted material can be work, can work, uh, bedded pack can work, hay and straw. The idea with this, the reason I go through this list is so that people will think about the different dry carbon sources that they have available to them. Because different parts of the country are going to have different materials. It should be dry, carbonaceous, and chunky um, when we're looking for something. So we'll lay out a bed of compost, a, a, a bed of, of wood chips. So these are windrows of, of compost, of compost of mortality or butcher waste. Next slide. It's always best to lay that bed out so that it's prepared for you when you get there. And if you have a bucket full of guts, you can take care of that. If, an, if you have an intact animal, you may want to lance the rumen or the, any baggy organs because the animal will bloat and blow up. And that's a pain. It'll blow the carbon source off of the pile. Next slide. For small, uh, for small animals, we're going to do those, and butcher waste, we're going to do those in layers. So we'll have layers of animals. Um, we'll put 24 inches of carbon down. Then we'll put a layer of animals. We'll put a layer of, of other carbon source in between. And that carbon source can vary a little bit more. The bottoms have to be really chunky material. The other layers can be lighter or, or more dense materials, but not too dense. So. If we bring wood chips or something like that in on the farm um, to get the bases started, that would be helpful. Then we can use other materials over those. Next slide. This is just a shot of butcher waste where they've made the bed. They've made a cup for that bed so that it, the sloppy material, the blood, the body fluids will not flow out of that but their material is nice and chunky, and then they're going to put that material in, and then they're going to layer that. Next slide. Uh, just in recap, if we have whole animals, we're going to put a layer of wood chips down, we're going to put the animal in, and then we're going to put a biofilter over top or a carbonaceous layer over top of that. That'll keep odors in and animals out. We won't have a lot of scavengers and, and the like digging into our piles if we have things properly covered. Next slide. 
make sure that all of the animal is covered. We don't want anything sticking out of the, of the pile because that's what is going to attract animals to the pile. And the most common animal that we have in the pile uh, would be our house pets. They are pretty brave and they'll go right up to the pile. Next slide, especially if things are not covered well. Just our illustration of how to make sure things are covered well. So we have wood chips down, we have absorptive material if we have very wet waste, we have an animal or butcher waste, and we have material over top. With a full size cow, we can just have one cow in a pile and it will work. But if we have a calf or a, a young calf or a deer or something small, it doesn't work as well. We need to have multiple, multiple materials. So we need to make sure that we, that we account for that and either put another nitrogen source in to make up for that or um, something else. We don't want to see things like this, um, animal bones being dragged home to their uh, to the neighbors. Next slide. One of the few tools that we use for um, to, to really monitor composting is a thermometer and the temperatures in the pile should be 110 to 160 degrees. We like them to be really 140 to 140 to 160. If they get too hot, it will either you'll have spontaneous combustion or you'll sterilize your pile and your pile may shut down. And if they're too low, you won't have the pathogen kill that we hope for. And we really, we've done a lot of research on looking at the pathogens in those piles. And if we have temperatures of over 110 for those durations, we kill most of the pathogens in those piles. Next slide. So in 12 to 24 hours, we should have um, temperature in our piles. If we don't have temperature in the piles, I don't advocate that people take those piles apart and try to rebuild them. I just chalk it up to let's try better the next, try, try again the next time. Um, if there's not enough, if it doesn't heat up, it just means we don't have enough air in that pile or we don't have um, the right mixes. We have to dense the material. In one month we'll, with a 1,200 pound cap, pound animal will have something that looks like cooked meat. Um, in, in two months it looks like digested meat, so microorganisms digest that stuff. And in three months we should have clean bones if we built our piles well. That doesn't give us mature compost. In nine to 12, six to nine months we'll have more of a mature compost that could be used someplace. Next slide. It takes four to, um, I'm just going to go back one. You can leave the slide where it is. Um, the frozen animals, if we have frozen animals, it's best to put them in piles before they melt. Um, it'll take longer for them to compost. They're not going to heat up in 12 to 24 hours, but they will heat up when the temperature, when the air temperature comes up. They'll melt and they will heat up pretty quickly right after that. So put frozen animals in piles and then let the nature take its course. Next slide. Um, we'll let it sit for four to six months. We don't tend to turn this type of composting. There are people that, people, some people do turn the compost. But if you liberate those odors, you're going to have neighbor issues. You're going to have neighbors calling. Some places you're really way out there and it's not going to be an issue. But in general, um, the process can work very simply with very little labor um, all by itself. So we advocate not turning those piles unless necessary. If you need to combine piles later on, you may turn those and combine those. Um, and that will bring more, increase the pathogen increase the pathogen kill. Uh, but don't turn before about three months unless you really have changed the process and really are managing the process to turn. You can reuse the bones as the, next, as, as the base of the next pile. 
And that's important because those bones are going to add to the structure of the, of the carbon source. So go ahead and use that carbon source, um, again, until it's really too fine to use. We also can land spread um, on non-human food consumption crops, some of that compost. Uh, for roadkill compost, we actually use it on roadside, but if we're tilling that material down, we can use that on cropland as well, just not human food consumption cropland. So we looked at different pathogens in the process um, to see what happens, and we have pretty good results. Uh, if you look at that green line on the screen, if you are above the green line, that's restricted material. You couldn't use that in your backyard. If you use that in your backyard, if you're below the green line, that could be used in your backyard. So we look at safety that way. There are pathogenic organisms everywhere, in our soils and everywhere else. So these are the levels that are deemed safe um, above and below that green line. We looked at fecal coliform and E. coli, and we had good inoculation of those those uh, samples, and then those samples went way down, and we were in great shape to land apply that material. Next slide. We look at temperatures. As I said, we monitor temperatures, and this is what's going to happen in a pile that's working properly. Uh, as you can see, all the way to the left side of the screen, those temperatures are going up very quickly. So they're going up to 70 degrees centigrade in there. And in this case, these piles were started very late in the season. So they started um, election day. And they didn't keep temperature as long as we like, would like them to keep temperature. But even with these temperatures, we were able to uh, get good pathogen kill in the process. So we were very pleased to see those results because it says that we have leeway in the process. We also went out and tested some piles that we had nothing to do with building, and we were in great shape with those with pathogens as well. Next slide. If people understand how uh, silage is made, when we're making silage, silage, we take all the air out of the silage. So when we're making silage, we're compacting that material. Next slide. When we're making compost, what we're trying to do is incorporate as much air as possible in that pile. So we really want light, airy material, not sawdust, not um, wood shavings that are going to blow away, but a good wood chip that's going to allow the air to flow through that pile and not compress and compact. So that's one of the messages that I want people to leave here with today, is make sure that you have the right carbon source. Course. The questions that I would, would uh, explain are make sure you have plenty of carbon source. And we try to, we, we make up lists of where carbon sources are for emergencies. And each farm or butcher operation may want to make up a list of their own to know where they can get carbon sources when they need them. Stockpile your carbon sources, but stockpile those in windrows. Um, don't, next, keep going. Uh, don't make big amorphous piles. We don't want these huge piles. We want a windrow that's a long, narrow size of the cow in width and as long as you have space for it. Um, next, keep going on the, just bring in all of those. Uh, so the size of the pile, make sure it's okay for you to do this because in all states it varies. And right now, uh, I my There aren't a lot of them. Um, so you really do need to work with your regulatory agency to make sure these things are legal. For the most part, more, our livestock mortality is acceptable, except for California. California still will not allow composting of mammalian flesh. Make sure you're covered really well. And odor is an issue. Odor is what shuts facilities down. So make sure that we don't have um, odor, odor issues. If we keep good coverage on our piles, we won't have odor issues.
was a 40,000 pound whale at one point, and it took about a year, and it worked. So don't worry about the size of your animals. Um, too small is actually harder than too large. And if there are any questions, In to, to be posted. Uh, we have a whole program called Natural Rendering, which covers livestock mortality, butcher waste, roadkill, and emergency response for poultry situations like avian influenza outbreaks. So there are a lot of resources out there, and hopefully those are posted on the websites that are listening to you can look at them. of you who've listened in, in today. Um, remind those of you who need to continue education credits if you have not done so already to submit your uh, information in the chat box for those who are CCAs or, or related, um, ESPs, whatever. Um, now that we've, we've had a number of questions that have been submitted and I would like to um, send those, uh, just to submit those to some of our speakers. Uh, and there's five or six that we can maybe, we maybe talk about in the remaining time. Um, one that was uh, submitted uh, dealt with disposal methods, and the question was, will the disposal methods listed eliminate the SRMs, the specific risk materials? The only, I'll answer that, the only uh, method that will, will uh, deal with the specified risk materials would be alkaline digestion, which is the one thing that doesn't, isn't very available. So that's why we encourage people not to compost those animals. There is some research that's going on in Alberta, Canada that's looking at scrapies um, as a freon and looking at the effectiveness of killing the scrapies or disabling the scrapies in, um, in, in uh, compost.